Conti Martin was in New York when her husband called from Washington. I feel a pain I've never felt, he told her from the ambulance. Ambassador Richard Holbrook had collapsed in Secretary of State Hillary Clinton's office. He died soon after. In dealing with her grief, Conti decided to go to Paris, where they had first started their romance. She writes about her life with Richard Holbrook, as well as her 15-year marriage to newsman Peter Jennings, in a memoir. It's called Paris, A Love Story. Cotty Martin is an award-winning author and journalist, and she joins me in the studio. Cotty, welcome to the program. Thanks, Vimi. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. You said that it seemed, after Richard had died, that he had disappeared. What do you mean by that? Well, it was just so sudden. I mean, he, he wasn't sick. There was absolutely no warning, no preparation, as, as, you, as you said. An hour before uh, he he collapsed, we were we were on the phone, um, and an hour before that, he um, we were planning our Christmas vacation. This was a year and a half ago, and um, Richard, you know, a lot of cliches have been attached to to Richard Holbrook: uh, hard driving, larger than life, bulldozer, uh, bull- yes, <laughs> among others. <laughs> um, and uh, there never was a more vital human being. He was very robust. It is true that um, he had one of the most stressful jobs in in the government. He he was in charge of um, Pakistan and Afghanistan for President Obama, and and that he was traveling to some pretty awful places, and uh, keeping hours that uh, that a man half his age shouldn't keep. But no indication that he had that he was sick. No, he no, wasn't none. in any pain. None, none, uh, none whatsoever. Which is of course a, a great blessing for him, but the shock. For me, was 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 total. I um, really uh, was shattered. Uh, we'd been together for seventeen years, and uh, I write in um, in the book that uh, that the year prior I'd had these these. I'm I'm Hungarian and therefore superstitious, and I had I had these these dreams that that um, that I was going to be struck down for my good fortune. That things were going too well. That you know the gods will punish you if you're too happy, and things were going well for us. Richard was granted he had a very tough job, but it was work he loved, and uh, our kids were doing well. And I had just written uh, my family's uh, memoir, uh, "Enemies of the People," which had you know beautiful reviews, and you know things were going so well. And when these late night fears circled i uh my my first thought was to my children because richard was indestructible he would always be there to pick up the pieces connie what was his condition when you got to the hospital well um he was he was already um uh, being operated on by this amazing team at the gw hospital here that uh Ironically, it was a Pakistani surgeon who was operating on him, and he, and he seemed to be extremely aware of who he was operating on. And, you know, a man who was trying to bring Pakistan back from the brink for 21 hours, they operated on Richard never regained um, consciousness. So Even- our, last, our last words were, in, were, were when he called from the ambulance, which you just cited, and my last words to my husband were, I'm on my way. Before being sedated for surgery, he, mm. he joked with his doctors. Yes, typically. <laughs> he said, see yeah. what you can do about, you know, uh, ending this war while I'm yeah. over in there. Right, right. Yes. I mean, it's so typical. The, the, I, I subsequently learned from, uh, of course, I was v- very interested in his, in his last words, and, and I subsequently learned from the, from the nurses and doctors that, that uh, one of the doctors had said to him um, when they were trying to sedate him, uh, uh, no easy matter with Richard Holbrook. Uh, think about something beautiful, and he said, "My wife, Kati." Mm. And um, yes, yeah, he, he Richard Holbrook will always be remembered for his role in ending the hostilities in Bosnia with the Dayton yes. Peace Accords. President Obama, as you said, um, assigned him to be special envoy to Pakistan and Afghanistan. Was he frustrated, Kati, with the lack of progress there? Oh sure, yes, absolutely. He was dealing with uh, with with the most impossible allies, if one can call them that, uh, imaginable, tougher than than uh, than bringing peace to uh, to Bosnia because he recognized that. Oh yes, oh yes. I mean, there there were just so many um, dimensions to this problem, and so many so many layers, and and so many. Um, 
countries involved. And, and when you're dealing with your allies, as Afghanistan and Pakistan are, nominally are, are allies, you can't threaten with bombs, as, as Richard effectively, whilst conducting diplomacy in, right. uh, with, with uh, Mil- Slobodan Milosevic, the president of Serbia, he could threaten an airstrike. Yes, and and did and and it 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 did bring them to the table. But here, no, um, and and you're dealing with with um, a nuclear powered Pakistan, uh, which is also uh, providing sanctuary to um, to the Taliban, and uh, the consequences uh, could not have been of greater import, which is what appealed to Richard. Richard liked to be in a place of maximum complexity, um, solving that, problems. That, that That's motivated him. That's who he was. He was a problem solver. You know, Pakistani President Zardari had traveled to Washington to be at uh, Richard Holbrook's memorial service. And he told you about his grief after his wife, Benazir Bhutto, yes. was assassinated. That was very touching, actually. He, first of all, that, that he would come all this way. Um, to the Kennedy Center Memorial, and then he insisted on seeing me, and he said, um, he said, you know, Kati, um, you have to let yourself um, feel the grief, and you have to allow yourself that, that pain. It was suddenly, it wasn't a head of state talking to, to a, a widow, it was a widower talking to a widow, and he said, he said, Benazir's things are as she left them. Uh, her beads are on the on, on her dressing table. Her saris hang in the closet. Um, it's, this was three years later. Yes, yes. Uh, so I was very, very, very touched by that. It was it was uh, very emotional. Cotty Martin is the author of seven books. She's an award winning former NPR and ABC News correspondent. She was married to the late diplomat Richard Holbrook, and her memoir is called Paris: A Love Story. Your family fled Hungary when you were a child. What were the circumstances? Well, uh, I had a very dramatic childhood. I, I, I kind of felt that I, you know, earned my, uh, you know, put in put in my drama early on, so that I was going to get a free ride the rest of the way. But uh, you were not so lucky. <laughs> that was that was not the. But but I, I want to say, Mimi, to to, uh, to you know this because you've read the book that this really isn't a book about grief. It's really about getting past grief to, as much as President Zardari um, hasn't moved anything that Benazir left, I've chosen a different path uh, in, in, in my, Richard is with me and will be forever. But uh, Richard would not want me to be uh, paralyzed by grief. And, and so this book is really about uh, going from loss to life, because none of us, as I learned bitterly, none of us escapes loss. Uh, sooner or later, uh, a, a harsh blow will find all of us. And maybe because you just asked about my early years and, and the circumstances of my leaving Budapest, maybe because I went through something tough as a little kid. Uh, that is to say, both my parents were arrested uh, when I was six years old and in during Cold War um, the Cold War period in, in Budapest, Hungary, where, where I was born and raised. And, and I, in my mother's case, I opened the door to her jailers, and, and I didn't see her for a year. And my father had already been arrested, and I didn't see him for two years. So maybe I have a survival gene from that period, which was, which was a very tough period because, because we, my sister and I, uh, did not know where our parents were or how long Right. When uh, they would come back. We'd be separated from them. So I'm not, I, I don't like separations very much. <laughs> I don't do too well with separations. You eventually, after coming to the United States, you went back to Europe as yes. a foreign correspondent for ABC News. Yes. That was 1978. And there you met Peter Jess. Yes. The... And let's just say you two hit it off. <laughs> yeah. Well, not right away. We were mutually unimpressed by our first meeting. It's kind of a scene from Pride and Prejudice, you know, when, when Mr. Darcy meets Elizabeth. <laughs> I thought he was a That's jerk. That's true. Actually. It was just like yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. We were not impressed by each other. He thought I, he overheard me making plans. Uh, this was my first week as foreign correspondent. Of course, Peter Jennings was by then, uh, you know, superstar. James Bond, he was called Peter of Arabia. He was inc- unbelievably good looking. And of course, 
even even when I thought what a jerk, I thought, wow, he's so good looking too. But uh, we didn't we didn't our 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 mutual uh, hostility at first meeting did not last very long. Now you said this in your book, quote. From the earliest days, the strains of a love affair between two emotionally needy and ambitious people were apparent. What did you mean by that? Well, just that. You know, this is an honest book. This is not a, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't varnish uh, who I am or who Richard was or who Peter was. Though these are public men, they are human beings, first of all, made of the same human stuff as the rest of us. Obviously, I am all too human. And uh, you know we we um, we are none of us paragons of perfection, I, and and that is not how I portray them. I hope you agree that I portray both both Richard and Peter with with great ref- respect and 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 great love, actually, because so, Peter Peter became the father of my children. So you know wh- that's a relationship that that um, that is lifelong. But you loved your job at ABC mm-hmm. News. Why did you quit after you married Peter? Um, Peter was a, a sort of a male chauvinist. He didn't. He although when he met me, I was already an ABC correspondent. He really wanted his wife to to be primarily focused on him and uh, not to be traveling all over the place. And in those days, ABC wasn't too excited about having a married couple in the same news division either. So I I decided that I would. Um, as, uh, after after our, the, the birth of our first child, Elizabeth, I decided that I'd try my hand at writing. I was on maternity leave, so intending to go back, but really was losing my enthusiasm for going back. And you and, became a great writer. You wrote well, seven books. Thank you. This is the eighth, actually. So, <laughs> You did move to New York mm-hmm. for Peter's job. What yes. impact did that move have on you and your family? Oh, huge, huge. Um, Peter became the you know America's number one anchor, and... Uh, but inside our family unit, uh, there was a huge loss of, of privacy and between us, loss of intimacy. The, the, to be the network anchor is a super stressful position. And, and we really lived from, from one ratings to the next. And they were always coming. And uh, tremendous stress and, and virtually no privacy. I mean, the minute we left our apartment, there, the privacy was over. Uh, we, People recognized him. You know, I, I describe in in the book the, the 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 really really sad, poignant uh, scene where 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 uh, many years after after our marriage, um, we were married for fifteen years, but by now the marriage has sadly uh, collapsed. Um, he called Peter called me uh, and asked me to meet him in Central Park, and he had some devastating news to deliver. He wanted me to be the first to know that he'd been diagnosed with lung cancer. And, uh, of course, I burst out in tears. And, uh, and he, you know, he pulled me ever deeper into the park. But everywhere we went, people recognized him. And I said, geez, they, you know, even— They can never let you be. Not for a minute. And, and he just shrugged. That was, that was his life. But it's very hard to, to, to live a, quote, normal life. With, with a person who is that recognized. The book we're discussing is called Paris, A Love Story. It's a memoir of Kati Martin. She's the author of now eight books, and she's an award-winning former NPR and ABC News correspondent. Kati, you had a lot of ambition as a young woman. Mm. How did that ambition evolve as you grew older? Well, <laughs> like most of us, I've had to... Uh, Compromise. Uh, I, I, I was ambitious not only to have a, a good professional life, but also to have a family, and that was uh, that proved tough with with Peter because um, it was it was just too too stressful to be foreign correspondent and and the mother of his children and and to have such frankly high maintenance um, ha- marriage writing. Which, which is what I, which is what I came to by by default, proved much more accommodating to to both my role as a, as a mother and and a wife. I found that you know I could I could write while the kids were were in school, and uh, and be available to them. 
was when it, they got home. Was it just as fulfilling, though, as your different, days as a correspondent? No, no, different different sense of fulfillment. Uh, I didn't get this, the same adrenaline rush that I would get uh, when when I was live on on uh, ABC or reporting from a from a war zone. I covered my share, uh, but it was in some ways uh, a more lasting reward because you know the books I've written uh, they're on my bookshelf and they're on a lot of other people's bookshelves and in libraries, and so I feel that. I'm proud of, of each one. Each one uh, took years to write, and and um, you know there's there's serious efforts. And my name is not exactly in lights the way I, I, I guess as a little girl I dreamed it might be, but uh, but I've had a good good long run, and and I can keep I can keep writing. I can't imagine not writing anymore. How would you compare your 15-year marriage with Peter Jennings with your 15-year marriage with Richard Holbrook? <laughs> oh, gosh. They're so different. Uh, I suppose what they have in common, other than that they both seem to like me, was that um, they, were, they were both uh, extremely um, high-achieving, triple-A personalities. But uh, Richard was, uh, believe it or not, far more self-confident than, than Peter. Peter, for all his his great talent, his great good looks, fame, wealth, whatever, whatever, was deeply uh, self, uh, deeply insecure. And I think partly because he never finished high school, so he, he, um, he had the sense that he was pulling one off on the world, that he was a fraud. And I used to tease him that he actually married me for my advanced degrees, of which I have several. <laughs> and, but it was, it was not entirely a joke because he, Peter, w- always overprepared for interviews. And, and that was part of, 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 of what gave him that edge that, that he had. So he was insecure, and insecure people can be uh, difficult to live with because uh, he was very critical, first of all, of himself, but also extremely critical of me. And I describe in the book one sort of semi-amusing scene where we're en route to have dinner uh, with uh, Prince Charles and, and Princess Diana. And I frankly thought I looked like a million bucks. I'd spent all afternoon getting dressed, and I had on this this uh, black uh, velvet strapless dress. And in the car on the way to this dinner here in Washington, D.C., Peter looked at me with that kind of quizzical killer look of his and said, are you sure you want to wear that? Oh, no. Uh, and, I, you know, there went my whole self-confidence, like air out of a balloon. And I spent all I, – I was seated next to Prince Charles, and I spent all night – fussing with my with the, the top of my dress to make sure I wasn't offending his his royal highness. <laughs> Why did you go to Paris after Richard's death? What were you looking for there? Escape. I was looking to get away. I found that I couldn't get on with my life. And uh, Paris was a place where he and I lived our best times. Even in the two years that he was working for President Obama, in Afghanistan, we would meet in Paris, and that so that that was our our kind of R and R place. But long before that, Paris was sort of the city where I became who I am as a as a um, teenager. I went there and uh, studied at the Sorbonne and spoke good French because I had learned French along with Hungarian in my Budapest childhood. And then at Paris is where Peter and I had our romance. So I describe the the different my different life. Uh, lives in in Paris, different um, in in 1968 when I was a student and then got caught up in the in the uh, student uprising there, which was a very serious business and kind of freaked me out because it was my second revolution. Because as a little girl, I had witnessed the the, the very bloody uprising in in uh, in Budapest, and so then I so I left Paris in in um, in fear and in haste. In, in 68 as a student and then and then had this amazing romantic time there with Peter. And then it's really where Richard and I got together. So I wanted to, I was looking for escape after, after terrible shock, after terrible grief uh, following Richard's death. But I also wanted to reconnect to the me that, that was before Richard and before Peter and the me that, that seemed kind of lost over the years. And I've, I've, I think I've done that. Paris is a place of such 
such unbelievable beauty and and resonance. It's I think beauty calms the soul. And uh, also, I didn't have quite as many reminders of Richard because Richard and I didn't have a daily life in Paris the way in in New York, everything, every tree reminds me of our daily life. And so in Paris, I have found healing and uh, and and also reconnection with uh, with with the former me. The memoir we're discussing is called Paris: A Love Story. Cotty Martin is the author of eight books. She's an award-winning former NPR and ABC News correspondent, and she was married to the late diplomat Richard Holbrook. You wrote this about your time in Paris, quote, Grief imposes its own rhythms. My feelings of loss and sadness collide with an appetite for life I've never felt since I was a girl here in 1968. An appetite for life? I, this, this may sound strange, but when, uh, when you've experienced the kind of shock that I did with Richard's entirely unexpected death, you realize how elusive life is and that you basically cannot count on, on anything. So forget future planning. This is it right now. This is it. This is, this is your life. This is my life. And we might as well just squeeze that lemon for all it's worth because, uh, because nothing is, is guaranteed. And so, you know, the irony is that, that even while... I've been grieving. I've been I've been really trying to savor life. It's it's sometimes uh, not so easy to do that. But um, but but I I um, I had a letter from the great writer Joan Didion shortly after Richard died. You know she, her her book The Year of Magical Thinking is it's a devastating account of her husband's death. And uh, she in her note that she. Um, dropped off at my apartment. She said, Dear Kati, I woke up this morning and I thought about you and I thought of all the mornings that you will wake up and think about Richard. And I thought, wow, I mean, that's, that's beautiful, but I don't want to wake up sad every morning for the rest of my life. I've got to get past this. I've got to assimilate this, this, this terrible hole in my heart but but live with it and and bring Richard along with me because holy cow seventeen amazing years with this man who you know we really lived uh, really in the front line of history and um, and that part of my life is is over but but it is part of me just as just as you know the trauma of of my Budapest childhood is is part of who I am and just as you know my my failed if I have to call it that, my failed marriage to the father of my children, Peter Jennings, that, that too is who I am. Uh, I am all of these things, but I, am, uh, but I still have other lives to live. And so in a way, my, my book is, is the opposite of Joan Didion's book, which is really about grief. My book is not about grief. My book is about the fact that, that loss finds all of us but then we have to find our way through it. And, you know, sometimes it's, it's, it's pretty hard. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I sound, I sound uh, entirely confident that I'm doing this, but of course there are, there are moments, unexpected moments when, when it, you know, I'm just hit like, it's like a body blow with the loss. But it's, this, is, this is the human condition. Have you thought about remarrying? No, <laughs> no, it's too soon. It's too soon. I, I, I think about living a full life, and I, and I've never been alone until now. I mean, I'm not proud of that, but I, you know, I went from, from my, from my family to marriage. You know, 15 years with Peter, 17 with Richard, and that's it. Boom, that's been my life. So, you know, it sounds a little retarded, but I'm having to figure out stuff now that, that a lot of people figure out in their in in their 20s and 30s you know making my way in the world on my own but but on the other hand i'm i'm not entirely alone i have wonderful children and work work is so important you know i i started writing this this book almost immediately after richard's death it started as a as a i i kept a journal when i couldn't sleep at night 
and and that's why I think people who've read it uh, have have noted that it it feels like you're actually living living it, living this this drama, uh, and that's because I was writing in in real time, and uh, and also it's partly based on on letters too that that. Uh, that I found, uh, I, I've had to clean out our our, um, our home of many many years uh, because it's it's too big and and too full of ghosts. And and in in that process, I I found these amazing letters that between Peter and me and uh, Richard and me, and also letters that I wrote to my parents from Paris. And so, Conti, what do you recommend to others who might be grieving the loss of a loved one? Well. Um, that that there is life after loss, there has to be, and that the the best way to honor the people that we love is to bring them along with us, um, to to really uh, assimilate who they are. I mean, I can hear I can hear Richard's voice all the time, and he's not telling me, Kati, don't get out of bed, stay home and weep, <laughs> because I'm not there anymore to fix things for you. He's telling me. Girl, <laughs> get out of here and and you know roll up your sleeves and 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 live because guess what you're still alive, and uh, how lucky are you you know to be alive on such a beautiful summer day and and to to be meeting interesting people like you Mimi, and you know unexpected unexpected things happen if you're if you're open to that if you're if you're open to living open to life so I I think this is actually a very, very much a life-affirming book. I want to end with a quote from your book that I thought was just so beautiful. It's this. I am loved, therefore I am. That was me. Now who am I? It's not the grand romantic moments that forge a couple. It's the daily granular sharing of the most trivial details of life that forged our bond. The freedom to share my least worthy thought, knowing that even when we disagreed, he was on my side. Mm. It's beautiful. Thank you. Thanks. Kati Martin, she's the author of seven books. This is her eighth. She's an award-winning former NPR and ABC News correspondent, and she was married to the late diplomat Richard Holbrook. Her memoir is Paris, a love story. It's published by Simon & Schuster. Kati, thanks so much for being on the program. Thanks so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> 